Hi everyone and welcome to Biology Professor. Today we're going to talk about a really cool topic and that is how microbes can actually jump host species and specifically looking at this from the point of view of humans. So when new pathogens jump over to the human species and infect them for the first time. So let's talk about how this happens. First, you need to know that all pathogens have a specific host, sometimes just one host, sometimes uh, a small set of hosts that they infect. And the hosts that a pathogen is capable of infecting is known as its host range. Now, sometimes a pathogen can actually jump from a host that it's been infecting um, for many generations into a brand new host species. And this is accomplished by mutation. So when the pathogen, whether it's a virus or a bacterium or a fungus, when it's genetic material mutates, sometimes that allows them to be able to infect a cell in a host that they previously were not able to infect. And so that's a result of that random mutation process. And there are a lot of diseases that you've heard of that have actually done this in the past. Things like smallpox, measles, HIV, um, bubonic plague, scarlet fever. These are all pathogens that once upon a time were actually what we call zoonotic diseases. So zoonotic or zoonotic, sometimes you'll hear that pronunciation, just means that they infect animal species other than humans. And so all of these used to be zoonotic diseases, but now at some point in human history, they jumped over into the human species and now they're major human pathogens. And so this is actually an example of speciation following habitation of a novel environmental niche. And all that means, uh, a novel environmental niche just means that um, there was an ancestral pathogen that could not infect humans. At some point it mutated and was able to infect humans. And so when it was able to jump into the human species, that new host was the new niche. And then you actually get two species of pathogen one that's capable of, of infecting the new species and then the one that's capable of infecting the old species. Um, so as an example, there is render pest and measles. I'm sure you've heard of measles, which infects humans, but the most closely related pathogen to measles is actually render pest, which is a, a closely related pathogen that infects cattle, um, buffalo, um, and, and a few other um, types of animals. And so, once upon a time, thousands of years ago, there was a common viral ancestor that was infecting cattle. And then cattle were domesticated, humans were living in close contact with cattle, and then at some point, right about here on this diagram, this um, pathogen actually jumped into humans for the first time. And after that, there was this divergence where there was one strain of the, of the pathogen that could still infect the cattle, that was the render pest virus, and then there was the strain that could infect humans, and that's the measles virus. By comparing the genetic material of um, sort of modern day viruses, render pest has actually been eradicated now, but of the, the last known render pest viruses with modern measles viruses, scientists can look at how many differences there are between those two viruses and can look at um, the estimated mutation rate of this virus and can actually estimate about when this jump occurred, when this jump into the human species occurred. And it was roughly um, a thousand years ago. And so we know that this happens, we're able to trace it, to use molecular clock techniques to even estimate approximately when it happened. Now let's talk about the process. Now it's got four steps. I'm summarizing these from the book uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond, which um, was published I believe in 1997. But these are the steps 
um, through which a pathogen that is a zoonotic pathogen infecting some animal species makes the transition into infecting human species. And so first, the first kind of step in that process is a pathogen that can transfer from animal to human only rarely. So sometimes a human can be infected, but there's no human to human spread. And even the human infection um, doesn't happen very often because that pathogen is still much more adapted to their current host species and isn't doing very well in the human host. So an example of this would be like tularemia, which is also known as rabbit fever. The next step is when the pathogen actually mutates to the point where it can enter into one human host and then it can spread from human to human, but it dies out rather quickly. Uh, an example of this would be in the late 1950s, there was a virus called the Onyongnyong virus. I think I'm spelling that correctly, Onyongnyong virus. And it caused an epidemic and it was kind of um, initially uh, a little scary, but then it died out. So it, it entered a population, it spread from person to person, several people got sick, but then that, that was the end of it. Um, and, and it was no longer part of, it was no longer causing human infections. Step three in this process is when an infection actually becomes established in humans. So not only can it transfer from human to human, but it's doing so on a fairly regular basis. It's not something that dies out quickly. So there are people that would put uh, Lyme disease into this category. Um, there are also people who would list the Zika virus in this category. Because with both Lyme disease and Zika, um, people get them, it's happening a lot. Um, so it's established in humans, but um, hasn't become necessarily a major killer of humanity. Even though Zika was pretty scary there for a couple of years in South America, um, for the most part that epidemic has really died down. There aren't very many people showing uh, Zika infections anymore. And so it's unclear whether Zika is going to be something that we're going to have to worry about in the future. And the final step of this process is when you have a disease that has become a major, long established uh, epidemic disease confined to humans. That means no longer um, jumping from an animal reservoir on occasion, but a, a sort of human to human transmission, sometimes um, aided by vectors like mosquitoes that um, have been major diseases of humans that have been causing disease in humans for a long time. So this would include um, things like malaria, um, tuberculosis, I'm going to abbreviate that as TB, uh, chickenpox, as well as some of these ones we've already talked about, smallpox, measles, HIV, plague, scarlet fever. Um, and so these are all examples of um, pathogens that have jumped into humans. And now the question really remains is, well, what's going to happen next? You know, what's going to be the next pathogen that we have to deal with that's going to be new to the human population because it's jumped over into humans from an animal? These things are happening um, on a fairly regular basis. You know, HIV jumped into humans as, as recently as sort of the late 1800s um, and so certainly you know the next one could be a, a major killer of humanity that we haven't even discovered yet so definitely something to keep in mind um, if you want to watch any other videos then you might be interested in some of my videos on um, my epidemiology and disease playlist also on my pathogen life cycles playlist so things like um, germ theory and um, the life cycle of hookworm and the life cycle of schistosomiasis parasite. Um, so definitely take a look at those and thanks for watching Biology Professor.